In this video, we want to explore the uh, aerospace system's life cycle, and then we'll continue with some development processes in the next video. So we want to start by looking at the learning outcomes, and then we'll review or look at what are aircraft and aircraft systems life cycles. Uh, they have certain stages, so we'll talk about those, and then we can talk about the design and development of aerospace systems. Talk about chunking things from the platform of the aircraft into the systems of the aircraft and then the units that make up the system, the subsystems and the subsystems of systems, etc. Talk about the concepts of validation and verification and the distinction between them. Then we'll summarize and look at what's next. Okay, when we finish this module, you ought to be able to list the stages of the aerospace systems lifecycle, articulate the difference between validation and verification articulate the difference between different kinds of development processes. That's the next video. So here's some aircraft, uh, military aircraft, over the last uh, uh, several years. And you can look at, sort of look at how long they stayed in life. Uh, the F-14 went into service in 1969 and stayed in service. It's still, you know, 2000, 2010, it was 41 plus years. Uh, in uh, the F-15, the same year went into service, and it served for 51 plus years. And of course, they're still flying in various uh, uh, various settings, but not in active duty. Uh, the CH-47 Chinook uh, first went into uh, service the year I was born in uh, 1956, and is expected to have a lifetime of uh, 71 plus years. So it's going to extend another 17 years from right now. Uh, the C-130 started flying in uh, uh, 1951. Uh, those are still flying, uh, and they'll be flying at least until another decade plus. KC-135s, based on the 707, uh, those are still in service uh, uh, and expected to serve, you know, and to, went into service in 1945 and expected to continue serving into the 2040s, so 86. And the, and the B-52, which we're going to look at in a little more detail, first uh, uh, some sense of service in 1946 and uh, going to continue to serve into the uh, 2040s. So here's the B-52 Stratoforcer. So it was first conceived of as a straight-wing six-engine prop design in 1946 as the XB-52. Uh, they briefed when this was first presented to the military. They said, well, they've got these jet engines now. Why don't you go back and uh, do this with jet engines? And so over the course of a weekend, uh, they went back and did this redesign, came up with a swept wing, did a balsa wood mock-up, made a 35-page uh, write-up about it. Uh, and then rebriefed the uh, generals about it and said, oh, here's your design with the uh, eight jet engines and these four nacelles uh, uh, together. And then you've got the uh, weapons pods and the extra fuel tanks uh, out to the side. First flown in uh, August of 1954. Uh, the next edition came out uh, not long after that and then through a series of editions up to the H edition. Uh, uh, which first flew in uh, uh, 1961. The last one of those was delivered in 1962, and here they are still flying. Uh, there were initially almost 750 manufactured, and about 10% of those are still in service. And again, the expected lifetime is out into the 2040s, uh, uh, close to you know, an 80, 90 year lifetime for this aircraft. It's amazing what you can do with good maintenance and updates. Of course, when they started this, the uh, cockpit had steam gauge uh, 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 avionics in it, uh, pressure gauges and the like, and then was updated to more uh, recently to more advanced avionics. I think it shares the same uh, uh, flight computer as the B2B, uh, which is the same flight computer that was used in the space shuttle. Here's the F-22, uh, first uh, uh, mentioned in 1981 as a replacement for the F-15 and the F-16 as the Advanced Tactical Fighter Program. Uh, the development contracts were first issued in, in 1986. Uh, airframe and engine prototypes were tested in 1990, and in 1991, Lockheed was selected as the uh, airframe supplier and uh, Pratt & Whitney as the engine. First flight six years later sometime in uh, 1997, and then first uh, production contracts were awarded in the year 2000, and planned uh, deployment of 750 aircraft. These things are so good that we don't want to sell them to anybody else. So uh, there's, you know, there's uh, that immediate. That's a, a negative to the manufacturers, of course. Uh, uh, when you, so there's reasons to wonder, you know, if the F-35 program was brought around uh, not just because uh, of uh, trying to develop a more advanced and cheaper aircraft, but also to make uh, uh, something available that could be sold to other countries. Anyway, we only built 187 of these. They were always uh, cast as uh, overpriced and the like, and yet it remains the most uh, superb fighter, I think most people agree, in our fleet. 
and the F-35 Lightning II. Its alleged replacement was first conceived of in 1993 as a joint advanced strike technology program. The idea was an F-16 replacement that would uh, uh, be able to serve all the branches of the service and also to be exportable and uh, built in conjunction with our allies and sold to our allies and, and developed with our allies. It was renamed the Joint Strike Fighter Program in 1995. Uh, uh, so it has three different uh, uh, variants, the uh, conventional takeoff and landing. A carrier takeoff and landing has to have a different, slightly different wings uh, in order to uh, uh, get the rapid takeoff and, and also to slow uh, quickly enough on the landing. And then a short takeoff vertical landing uh, aircraft for use by the Marines. So these are the A and B and C versions. The uh, first, uh, 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 the X-35 uh, was first demoed in 2000. Uh, the contract was awarded to Lockheed Martin and Pratt and Whitney in 2001, uh, and the first flight about five years later. You can see it takes about five or six years between when these are first really sort of. Uh, I mean, the, you see the conceptualization takes place. For, it takes a long time to come up with the, uh, uh, the idea, the concepts, uh, uh, develop prototypes, and then between the awarding of contracts and the first flight, uh, you know, five or six years, which we saw with the F-22 also. And then here between uh, the first flight in December in 2006 to the initial deployment, nine years. Nine years just between when they first started flying these things and then between the testing and continuous development and changes, uh, it took nine years to get this thing deployed. Anticipating building about 2,500 of these, 2,450 or so, and uh, currently five, or that's just for the U.S., and there's going to be global market for this too, as you know. Uh, these are built, uh, designed and built in conjunction with our allies in Britain, uh, Asia, uh, and the Middle East and the like, and, and so they are available you know, to export to those countries uh, or to be manufactured in those countries. So you see there's some of the concepts that, that we've talked about here already. Uh, there's a uh, even before design. There's a conceptualization phase. It's not mentioned on this slide here, uh, and then the uh, design and development. And you can see the overlap between when the design starts and when the actual development uh, design on paper development actually starting to put some pieces together, and then production actually you know development including prototyping, and then production is when we actually have a factory built to do this thing. Uh, it gets deployed. So use is deployment, and while it's in deployed, there has to be support and maintenance. And then at some point, these aircraft are put out of service. And so there is a, a, a disposal phase or a, 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 a <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name, uh, another phase from the, it'll come to you at the end of this video, I'm sure I'll come up with it, uh, uh, when they're put out of service. Uh, so again, this is uh, the aerospace systems life cycle. It's shown here with six phases. There can also be a seventh phase, which is a conceptualization. Um, authors and uh, um, People in this area are not consistent in terms of the labels here. So this is another one of these uh, where things change from one author to the next. Here's another way of looking at this uh, with a little more detail on the development part and that you have the uh, conception phase and then you have a definition phase. And you can see sort of some of the feedback here. Uh, previous uh, uh, engineering um, has been uh, uh, employed here. It's sort of a technical life extension uh, for some aircraft like the B-52. Uh, and then uh, moving into development uh, uh, in the development, then you have you know development, then construction and prototypes and prototype testing before it finally goes to production. Production, you're going to have testing in the faculty. That's sort of the factory acceptance test, the FATS. And then once it's actually deployed, then you would have the site acceptance test, the SATS. Uh, and so now it's deployed, it's in operation. Uh, and so while it's there, you have to have a support, maintenance, and the like. You can also upgrade uh, aircraft in that time. And then uh, either they get upgraded, technical life extension, as it says here, or uh, they get disposed, or uh, 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 <laughs> I had it and then it's gone again. Uh, uh, decommissioned, that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, they get decommissioned. Here's yet another way of looking at this, and it shows some of the various uh, uh, who's involved at which sectors of the uh, uh, process are more involved. You can see that uh, uh, design engineering starts off early uh, during the development and produ uh, production phases uh, very strongly and decreases, whereas uh, manufacturing engineering kicks up there during the production phase, as one might expect. And then test engineering sort of continues over the whole uh, life of the aircraft, although certainly there's a, if there's a test and evaluation phase in particular, uh, it's going to be uh, more extensive there. So 
uh, the effort that's required for these things and ha how many uh, different engineers and uh, technicians are involved changes as it goes from one phase to the next. And here's another way of looking at it that gets into some of the issues of, uh, of how do you design and develop these systems. Um, you start off very generally with things that the aircraft system should be able to do. We need an aircraft that can go Mach 1.5 and that can carry so many pounds of bombs and so many types of weapons uh, uh, or has search surveillance equipment on it. We need to develop a spacecraft that can go into a, 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 a high Earth orbit and can observe X-rays emitted from galaxies in, you know, so far away uh, at certain, under certain conditions. Uh, so the conceptualization phase, which comes before all this, is sort of talking about what the, the system as an aggregate should be able to do. And that's going to have its own requirements. And requirements are going to be statements of uh, the blank, the system shall, the system shall do this, the system shall do that, the system shall, and the like. And so those are the requirements for the aircraft. And every point, anytime you have requirements for a system, you have to stop and ask and say, are these the right requirements? Is the system doing, is it going to do, if it's built the way we want it to be built by these requirements, will it actually do what we want it to do? And so uh, it's, it's understanding what the system needs to do and whether the requirements are consistent with what the system wants to do. And that process is called requirements validation. You see that on each of these uh, uh, panels on the left here, each of these uh, vertical segments on the left. So we start with the aircraft requirements, and we try and uh, identify the requirements for the aircraft. And then we do what's called functional decomposition or uh, system decomposition. We want to break the aircraft down into separate systems, such as the airframe itself and the structures and the hydraulics and the landing gear. And then, of course, you have the avionics and all the various avionics systems. And they will, of course, have to interface with the hydraulics and uh, other types of actuators, sensors and uh, uh, actuators as part of that. So as you move to the right here, you go from the aircraft requirement identifications to the systems requirement identifications, and, and you break these down into these uh, smaller chunks. There's these, uh, you see these yellow boxes here. These are some of the things you have to do. We're not going to get into the details here. The FHA's functional hazard analysis. What could go wrong? And, and do you have a safety assessment? You know, how are you going to ensure the safety is uh, met? And the like. So again, we don't want to get into that level of detail, but there's this idea of chunking the system down, the aircraft system itself, into a smaller, uh, smaller systems, and, and, and how those all fit together. So this idea that an aircraft itself is a system of systems, and then each of these systems can be broken down. Uh, here on this diagram, they're called units, but this can go on for several layers as you go into subsystems and subsystems. So a, a flight control uh, computer. Uh, may uh, uh, require uh, uh, different systems itself. Uh, uh, so you go into the item requirement identifications. Again, these will have their own requirements, and each of these will have their own work necessary to validate these requirements at the smaller level. Once you sort of get down to the smaller, uh, smallest level of these items, that's when you can actually start building stuff out of hardware and software. Uh, uh, whether the hardware is uh, uh, structural hardware or whether you're talking electronic hardware, uh, we're going to be focusing more on electronic hardware and the software that runs on that. So you have this software development process, then you have this hardware development process, meaning things like whether you're doing stuff with discrete gates or developing uh, uh, integrated circuits for this, or whether you're using FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays, or whether you're just using uh, microcontrollers and microprocessors for this. So once you go back up the other side here on the right-hand side of the graph, now we're starting to talk about verification of the various uh, uh, items first. Are they doing what they're supposed to do? So if uh, uh, validation is asking about the requirements, are the requirements right, and is the system the right system? Are we designing the right thing? Verification asks, is the thing doing what we want it to do? Is it doing it right? Uh, and so then this goes back up the same way. Uh, you put the, uh, you check the items one by one, make sure they're working, and then they have to be integrated together into the subsystems, and the subsystems have to be integrated into the systems. Uh, and, and in each of these stages, as you do this integration of the smaller parts together to make the larger part, you do this verification stage to see if things are working the way they're supposed to work. Uh, and then as you put it all back together to get the aircraft, once you get it in integrated, then you can do the verification to see whether the aircraft is working the way it's supposed to work. And so so the, on the right-hand side is more the testing because verification implicitly in, in, involves testing. 
Whereas the validation part is really uh, uh, talking to the, the the engineers, talking to the uh, uh, the customer to find out what the customer really wants uh, to make sure that the, what the system is doing is what it's supposed to be doing. So the validation is to make sure that the system satisfies the customer user requirements. That is, are we making the right system? Whereas verification is, does, does the system meet its own requirements? Are we doing it right? Is it, is, it, is it meeting the specs, so to speak? And these occur over the entire life cycle of development, as you can tell. Ideally, these are done by independent uh, engineers. So uh, particularly for civil aviation, the FAA mandates that the verification and validation has to be performed by teams that are independent from the developers. Uh, independent means they report to a different uh, vice president or director or something like that. So somebody else is doing their performance evaluations. So you don't have the uh, performance evaluation uh, of the team doing the development done by the performance evaluate same person who's doing the uh, performance evaluation of the team doing the uh, VNV. Uh, these are independent ideally. The military is less stringent about this. So, um, major aerospace and weapon systems uh, have long life cycles. Uh, there's overlapping stages in this, and, and I'm going to leave, this is sort of my framing of it. You have the conceptualization, the design, the development, and then the production, the deployment, and the operation, and then the decommissioning. So I, I see it in terms of seven, but as you saw, there are other ways to frame that. Some people leave off the concept, some people leave, uh, don't make a distinction between deployment and operation, etc. And then aircraft and assist aircraft systems and aerospace systems are decomposed into smaller subsystems until you finally get down to sort of a unit and you can do unit testing uh, and you have this constant validation and verification at each of the levels you're working at. Validation, are we doing the right thing? Verification, are we doing it right? So that's it for uh, sort of the aerospace systems lifecycle. Next time, we want to get into sort of the unit design and development processes, and we'll talk about uh, sort of the distinction between planned development approaches and agile approaches. And that'll be next time around. Thank you.